got to try to choose to see the brighter side of the dullest things and know that even the darkest clouds still have got a silver lining when you feel you've gone astray the sun will come and light your way you will be guided through the thick and thin through all your losses all your wins through the black and white through the light of the day and the dark of the night through the golden hour where the sunlight falls just try when it seems you cannot weather another long and lonely winter your bones are cold and your heart it aches for the shelter of a love that's tender the sun will come and light your way and warm you with its lovely ray you will be guided through the thick and thin through all your losses all your wins through the black and white through the light of the day and the dark of the night through the golden hour where the sunlight falls just Welcome to Westwood, a, United, a <laughs> Unitarian Universalist congregation. We aim to support each other in our spiritual journeys, drawing from the religion, from the wisdom of many religions, as well as many individuals, and our growing science-based understanding of the world and of ourselves. We're a community open to everyone and anyone willing to embrace our shared principles. We're one of many congregations across the country and the world, and we've been around for centuries. Let us take a moment to remind ourselves that we're privileged to be present on Treaty 6 territory, the traditional lands of First Nations and Métis people. It's up to each of us to develop our understanding of what this means in today's terms, as we're all part of this ongoing treaty. Our website has a wealth of information to help us. To add some reality to these wishes, Westwood will be offering three Sunday afternoon events. In February, we're going to explore the land under our feet, going back in time. And in April, we will meet descendants of the people who lived and still live on this land, hear present day concerns and explore ways we can work together. And in June, with Miranda Jimmy, we'll consider what connecting to the land as an act of reconciliation means in a modern, capitalist, urban environment. My name is Lorian Kennedy, and my pronouns are she, her, and I'm your service leader today. Our musician today is Carrie Day. Our technicians are Hannah, Bill Lee, and Brenda Niscaro. And our speaker this morning is David Belrose, who's coming to us online, and I'll tell you more about him later. To receive information about our upcoming services and events, please sign the guest book on the table at the back and include your email address. You can also sign up to receive the e-newsletter via our website. Next week, you have a choice to come to Westwood in person at 1030 for a small informal discussion type service, we call it a serendipity service with host Sarah McEwen, or to join the National Canadian Unitarian Council service 
online at 11, and it's covenant, covenanting through transitions. And the link for that's on our website. And now I'll light the chalice. So we open the service this morning with words from Warmth in Winter, that seems terribly appropriate, by Ben Sewell, courtesy of the UUA Worship website and David Belrose. Now has come hard winter with whip of wind and slash of snow and the diamond bright stars in the black ice of the heavens. Just as we resist the season with shovel and scraper, wool and windbreaker, we embrace it with sled and snowboard, cocoa and comforter. Winter is here. Let us find warmth in this time of being together. And let's start that off with our first hymn, number 54. I'm a little shorter. <laughs> Candles of joy, concern, and gr gratitude. That's a ritual that bind us together each week. For those of us who are online, you may enter your concern in the chat or let us know that you'd like to speak by just waving your hand um, so that we can bring you into the building to speak for yourself. And if not, I'll read any of the chat once out loud. Also, if you want to come forward, if you're in the building and you can light a candle and speak, or you can just light a candle in silence. And we're happy also to bring the microphone to you as well. So we'll begin with the candles of people in the building. No, okay, thank you. So I'm going to light another candle. This is a happy birthday candle. And uh, we will sing happy birthday because it's the end of the month and we sing happy birthday for everybody, for all the people who had birthdays in January and anybody who got missed from earlier. So go ahead. Yeah. And I'll light one final candle for all those things 
that we hold in our hearts and we haven't spoken out loud. So may our thoughts of love and compassion be with those who shared and with all others as well. And we take time to reflect on the light and dark present within us and around us. would join us in the affirmation. May the light of these candles inspire us to use our power to heal and not to harm, to help and not to hinder, to serve the spirit of truth in loving affection and trusting hope. We give thanks for the many gifts of our communities. We thank those who continue to safeguard our spiritual communities by continuing to send in pledges and offerings, including offerings of time and talents. Thank you to everyone for continuing to share your gifts. And if you wish to make a gift, the information for doing so is on the right hand side of this slide. Let us acknowledge our offerings as we sing together from you I receive. Another hymn, uh, number 346, come sing a song with me. from Thunder Bay and the Lakehead Unitarian Fellowship, where he's been a member since 2005. 
David currently delivers a monthly service there using resources from a Unitarian resource called Touchstones, which we're now exploring ourselves. He's been on the Lakehead Fellowship's board and Sunday Services committee, Worship Committee, and his spiritual journey has been multifaceted, embracing a variety of traditions anchored within Unitarian Universalist principles and sources. Thanks so much to David for bringing his talents to us with the topic, winter and wintering. Thank you, Lorian. I am really grateful for the opportunity to be with you. And uh, I say good morning and greetings from Thunder Bay. It is a real pleasure to be with you. Spring, summer, fall, and winter. We are now deep into winter. It was minus 27 in Thunder Bay this morning. And the days are, though, gradually getting longer. Now, winter is a season that comes around every year, and it differs hugely around the world. Winter varies by hemisphere, latitude, longitude, altitude, temperature, climate patterns, and more. And of course, the further north one goes, the more dramatic is winter's impact. Now, in looking, I notice Edmonton is 10 times the size of Thunder Bay, and you are about five degrees further north in latitude, but there are some climate similarities between our cities. You average 2,299 hours of sunlight per year compared to 2,121 for us. Our average Temperatures in summer are the same, while your winter average is four degrees warmer. Now, this talk is rooted in a Northwestern Ontario perspective on winter, and I want to begin with a poem that shares that perspective. And the poem is entitled, Greetings. We are here again, enclosed in winter, a week's trail of birch bark from door to stove, deep paths to bird feeder and wood pile, a tunneled driveway connecting us tenuously to the world. We are comfortable in the community of season, a neighbor's smoke rising, the muffled sound of country dogs. On this hard, bright day, I have broken a new trail up an old beaver flow. The tracks of hare are everywhere. Tonight, Foxes will follow in my steps, preferring them to drifts. Even moose will confirm my route. At midnight, I will dream of their movement, tracks appearing, tying it all together while I sleep. Tomorrow and the next and the next, we will remain frozen in landscape, content with small circuits of intimate things. Eventually, though, the sharp edge of tracks will soften. Somewhere, an icicle will drip to oblivion. The simple, clear rigidity of our world will collapse to spring's writhing. Now, this poem is from a, a book of poems, Wood Stove and Raisin, Ravens, that was written by Robert Farmer, a former member and president of Lakehead Unitarian Fellowship. Now winter, especially as we go further north, can be brutal. Of course, most of us can winter in homes that protect us against cold and snow, but not all. For homeless people or those living in substandard housing, winter can be brutal, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. In addition, resources for wintering are limited. And beyond this, many people struggle with winter, whether related to the weather outside or the weather within. And wintering is the process by which we attend to both. Edith Sitwell suggests, and I would agree, winter is a time for comfort, for good food and warmth, for the touch of a friendly hand, and for a talk beside the fire. It is the time for home. 
Now, my Chinese astrological sign is the horse, but I think it should be the bear, as my impulse is to hibernate in winter. Of course, instead of that, we try to operate as though winter is of little consequence. Some people embrace winter and find joy in seasonal outdoor activities and sports and even polar picnics. Of course, there are those who disagree. As Dave Barry put it, the problem with winter sports is that, and follow me closely here, they generally take place in winter. Now, I must admit a bias here as I spent almost 14 years trudging through winter snow as a letter carrier. And winter weather can often lead me to Shakespeare and now is the winter of our discontent. We each approach winter differently. Wintering is the process of navigating winter, a season that is, in many ways, a time of regeneration. Of course, there is the external season, but there is an internal season that also requires wintering skills. And there are individual differences, as Martin Marty noted when he contrasted a summery spirituality with a wintry spirituality. Now look at that more later. For some, winter pushes them outdoors, while for others, it pulls them indoors. Now for both, regeneration is an essential process, whether by the exhilaration of downhill skiing or the contentment of drinking hot cocoa in front of a fireplace. Reverend Jane Thixton looks at the difficulties of winter and wintering. Winter does have its purpose. Winter invites us to slow down, to go within, to explore the inward soul, the silence, the darkness, the very bleakness of our surroundings, as well as the promptings of our bodies, suggest that we are entering a season of quiet, of reflection, and of low productivity. Like the earth, we have our seasons too, and spring within can only come if some winter has come first. The winter of the soul can be a bleak time, a time of barrenness, emptiness, and darkness. It is often not clear that it is a seasonal cycle and that spring will follow. It can be a short cycle or it can last a long time. It can feel like a wasteland, like nothing is being accomplished, like creativity has withered. It can feel like your soul is dead just as the winter of the earth makes the earth appear dead. If we don't recognize it as a necessary cycle, it can lead us to despair, and despair is not fertile soil for the growing of the fruits of the soul. I know that the past few COVID years have often felt to me like extended wintering. In her book, Wintering, The Power of Rest and Retreat in Difficult Times, Catherine May writes, Everybody winters at one time or another. Some winter over and over again. Wintering is a season in the cold. It is a fallow period in life when you're cut off from the world, feeling rejected, sidelined, blocked from progress, or cast into the role of an outsider. Perhaps it results from an illness, or a life event such as bereavement or the, or the birth of a child. Perhaps it comes from a humiliation or failure. Perhaps you're in a period of transition and have temporarily fallen between two worlds. In emphasizing care, she writes that wintering is a time for reflection and recuperation, 
for slow replenishment, for putting your house in order, doing those deeply unfashionable things, slowing down, letting your spare time expand, getting enough sleep, resting, is a radical act now, but it is essential. She writes, to get better at wintering, we need to address our very notion of time. We tend to imagine that our lives are linear, but they are in fact cyclical. The physical, emotional, and spiritual challenges of winter call for skills, activities, and practices to use in the wintering process. These are aspects of a theology of care, both self-care and caring for others. A theology of care in the context of wintering is grounded in our first three principles the inherent worth and dignity of every person, compassion in human relations, and acceptance to one another and encouragement to spiritual growth. Some of our sources also inform this theology, a renewal of the spirit and an openness to the forces that create and uphold life, the transforming power of love, the guidance of reason and the results of science, and to live in harmony with the rhythms of nature. A theology of care focuses on doing, on living our principles and values into action. It draws on belief and wisdom, but it is grounded in action. A theology of care is a practical theology as it seeks, notes UU theologian Thandeka, to be a faith in action way of loving beyond belief. A theology of care includes pastoral care, but it is not limited to the role of a minister because of our congregational commitments to shared ministry especially true for Westwood right now, being lay-led after 14 years of professional ministry. Just as an aside, Ann Bar Barker was one of my lay chaplaincy trainers back in 2007. Now, our role in this kind of care is to be a companion, which means to break bread with. And in this context, bread is a metaphor for paying attention, compassionate presence, deep listening, nurturing, empathy, kindness, respect, holding in heart and mind, hospitality, and emotional, social, and spiritual support. Being a caring companion involves the work of love, of being a spiritual friend. It is not about having answers or trying to fix someone. It is being with someone and being for someone. Self-care and caring for others are fundamental to a theology of care. I mentioned wintry spirituality earlier, and here are some thoughts on it from Reverend Kirk Lodeman Copeland, who happens to lead the Touchstones Project. This is his piece called Wintry Spirituality. UU minister Greta Crosby wrote, let us not wish away the winter. It is a season to itself, not simply the way to spring. And Martin Marty adds, winter is a season of the heart as much as it is a season in the weather. He cautions that those possessed of a summary spirituality are prone to disregard this season of the heart. In winter, 
we must rely on a wintry spirituality. A wintry spirituality demands faith, faith that there is more than meets the eye or touches the heart, more love, more hope, and more life. In winter, less appears to be less, but it is so much more than meets the eye. Fallowness, our idleness, provides a blessing of renewal, and renewal, though hidden from view, is a more active process than we imagine. And winter also requires patience, for the changes that this kind of spirituality foster happen slowly. We must learn not to hurry winter, but to wait on it. Winter invites meditation, an encouragement to reflect, perhaps, on things for which we have no words. In the great spiritual traditions of the world, meditation is the discipline by which we move beyond words to what is. This essential isness is too immediate and complex and mysterious and sublime and simple to be captured in mere words. This is why the mystics are unable to speak directly about their experiences of encounter with ultimate reality. In this way, they are like those poets and watercolor artists who convey as much with silence and empty space as they do with word and image. Perhaps this is the sacramental aspect of winter and art, to draw us into mystery without ever finally naming it for us. Winter offers a way of being religious. Dogmas and doctrines, creeds and decrees, questions and answers, so many words and so little understanding. Let us instead seek enough silence to protect us from the idols of our own certainty. Let our gaze return again and again to some familiar winter landscape, perhaps the one outside our kitchen window. Certainly that's true for me. Let us meditate on it like a verse from scripture, allowing it to teach us year in, and year out, what we still must learn and yet already know. With each meditation, we will be aware that the winter weather has altered this outer landscape, just as each day lived alters our inner landscape. The changes, though imperceptible, are cumulative. It is only by paying attention that we understand that winter is not one season, but many. Even if we cannot name the changes in snow and ice, in temperature and light, we can learn to sense them. Most people think that prayer is words. More often than not, it is silence. It is a way of opening ourselves to that which is. UU minister Jacob Trapp said that to pray is to listen to the revelations of nature, to the meaning of events. And in this way, winter is a prayer without words. Do you understand that we need silence just as the Northern Hemisphere needs winter? Each, in its own way, is a path to new life, prelude to renewal. Let us not wish away the silence. It, too, is a season to itself, not simply the way to something else. It takes great discipline to wait. 
it would be much easier to do something, anything, or everything, to bring an end to waiting. But winter, both the outer and inner season, must proceed according to its own calendar. As it progresses, we eventually begin to recognize subtle changes that otherwise might have escaped our notice. Often the outer changes appear first. First light comes earlier and the winds blow less cold. But the more important changes are those within. The sense of renewal intensifies as we somehow feel more energized. Surely, slowly, but surely, we seem more alive than we have in a long time. Edna O'Brien suggests, in a way, winter is the real spring, the time when the inner thing happens. As Robert Farmer remind, reminded us in his poem, eventually though, the sharp edge of tracks will soften, somewhere an icicle will drip to oblivion. The simple, clear rigidity of our world will collapse to spring's writhing. So may we all find the ways to care for ourselves and others as we move through winter. May we find comfort and renewal in our wintering. And may we always remember that spring will eventually come. May it be so, and blessed be. Thank you, David. We have a third hymn, Stillness Reigns, number 49. Our closing words this morning are from The Turning of the Seasons by Reverend Dr. Andrew Pacula. May you know fully and deeply the blessings of each of your heart's seasons. 
the inward turning of winter, springtime's lush renewal, the effortless steady growth of summer, and autumn's rich harvest. May your passage from season to season be blessed, eased by hands to hold, and by the light of love to guide you on. Please stay and have a visit with each other. And for those of you on Zoom, you're invited to visit with each other uh, in the main area, or if there's enough of you to join a breakout room. Have a wonderful day.